Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Idea Me Show, the show that profiles individuals behind really big ideas that are shaping our world, inspiring the future, and future creators, and for all those that like great stories. Um, Ira Pastor, your life sciences ambassador, along for the journey today. Uh, so the theme of desertification, uh, which is a type of land degradation in dry lands where a variety, a variety of the, the biological productivity is lost due to natural processes or induced by human activities, where fertile areas become increasingly arid due to either climate change or uh, overexploitation of the soil is going to be our topic today. Uh, and obviously, one of the countermeasures for mitigating or reversing the effects of desertification is reforestation. Uh, and back in 2007, the African Union uh, started what was called the Great Green Wall of Africa Project uh, in order to combat desertification uh, in 20 different countries across the Sahel and Sahara regions. Uh, the wall is projected to be 8,000 kilometers wide, stretching across the entire width of the continent, uh, has $8 billion so far in funding, uh, and to date has restored up to 36 million hectares of land. Uh, and by 2030, the uh, initiative plans to have a total of 100 million acres under restoration. Uh, we're honored today to be joined by Dr. Paul Elvis Tongam, uh, who is coordinator for the Great Green Wall Initiative at the African Union Commission, and he's located at their executive branch at AU headquartered in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Uh, before joining the African Union, uh, Dr. Kangam worked as Regional Enterprise Development Manager for Tree Aid International, uh, which is a UK-based uh, international development charity. He also worked with the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations uh, as a technical advisor for programs to promote different groups engaged in forest-based product enterprises. Uh, he has served with other organizations on these fronts, including Center in Scotland, Environmental Justice Foundation in London, the Watershed Task Group in Cameroon. Uh, and he's also a very well-known mentor and coach uh, and behind the establishment of a variety of well-known startups in Cameroon, West Africa. Uh, Dr. Tongam holds a Bachelor in Science from the University of Shangi in Cameroon, a Master's in Science in, Eco in Ecology and Management in uh, at the University of Edinburgh, Executive MBA from PGSM in Paris, and a PhD in Business Administration, uh, and several certificates and diplomas. He's also a member of several professional networks, including the Junior Chambers International, where he's a senator, and a pioneering member of World Greening Alliance, which was created by the World Business Council for Sustainable Development uh, and the LDM Group in China. Uh, Dr. Tongam, thank you for taking the time out today to uh, come talk to us for a little while. Thank you. Thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Ira. Thanks a lot uh, for for bringing me to your program. I'm quite flattered to be here. Thanks a lot. <laughs> it's our pleasure. And it's, uh, it's a truly a fascinating uh, project that you're involved with. Uh, typically on the show, we start things off by uh, handing our guests the floor for a little bit just to uh, talk about themselves, if you would. Uh, if you could take a little time just to introduce yourself, uh, a little bit of your background, sort of, you know, where you grew up, how you got interested in ecology, uh, in, in business administration, and sort of how you worked your way through a variety of these organizations and now are, are leading this really fascinating uh, project at the African Union. That'd be a great way to, to start off. Yeah, uh, thanks again. Uh, yes, so I'm uh, originally from Cameroon, uh, in Central Africa. Uh, you know, Cameroon, I'm a uh, uh, it's it's a very it, it is called uh, Africa in miniature. So we we grow up with nature. It's it's a very very diverse country with 280 uh, ethnic groups, more than 300 languages, with uh, um, uh, with very rich uh, history. You know, uh, you have the, the the desert and you have the the oceans and everything that you can imagine. So it's a country of nature, you know, it's a country full. Where, where you're growing up as a, 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 a young guy or a child, nature is all around you, wherever you go. So um, it gets to inspire you to become more interested in nature, uh, uh, to be very interested in the prote protection of nature. You grow up with, with, with animals, you grow up with, you know, with, everything around you. So by so doing, you gradually start developing um, um, uh, uh, interest in, in the protection of the ecosystem around you. And that informs also that immediately set a pathway for your, for your career. 
And, uh, you know, so in the university, uh, I, University of Chang, which is one of the, the main universities, uh, development universities in Cameroon, we did uh, geography and uh, 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 which I call in French geography, a uh, management, a uh, development, which is more like geography and uh, development geography. You know, so um, after that, I went into immediately, you, I went into uh, all type of natural uh, biodiversity conservation uh, activities, you know, with local NGOs, we created local NGOs that we started doing biodiversity surveys, you know, what it means going around uh, surveying, looking for gorillas, looking for chimpanzees in the in our part of the country, which was very uh, intense as a young man. And then uh, coming back, creating uh, school environmental clubs and things like that. And then uh, from there, I went to the University of Edinburgh, where I did the geography, um, uh, ecology uh, and management. You know, University of Edinburgh is also at the school of what we call the King's, uh, the, the, the King's Building in the University of Edinburgh, which is the, the, the master's uh, or the postgrad uh, part of, of the environment, uh, climate change uh, uh, school. So why there also you get very interesting because it's a very professional institution. We got very interested in, um, in the, it was the days of climate change when there was a lot of uh, discussion around climate change you know, and uh, also why they also got interested in what was happening around me. I was a, vol a volunteer at the Bush Estate. Bush Estate is uh, one of the forestry estates of the University of Edinburgh, where we were doing a replanting of trees that have been destroyed by reindeers, uh, doing uh, experiment, uh, do, uh, supporting the school with um, a carbon experiment. And we did a lot of practical work while in Edinburgh. And so from there, you know, come back, work with uh, the FAO. So the whole, my whole life has always been around nature. And I think uh, uh, coming from uh, the, the Congo Basin, Cameroon is basically in the Congo Basin. You know? And then, uh, but I also got very interested in what is happening in the dry lands of Africa, you know. What, how is it like those who are living in the heart of the Sahel? Those who are living in the heart of the dry lands of Africa. So that's how um, I, I went to West Africa with Triad, and uh, I was involved in uh, looking at issues to do with livelihood, uh, some sort of market-based conservation. Looking at what what communities do to ensure sustainability of their environment, sustainability of their livelihood, sustainability of their culture, sustainability of everything, and so. There, I was the regional manager in charge of uh, enterprise development. And here, enterprise is mostly natural resource-based enterprise, tree-based enterprises. How do people use um, uh, um, um, tree-based resources like she bought her, tamarindos, uh, um, uh, various products that they use for marketing, uh, for development of uh, value chains, not only for their own subsistence, but also for income generation. And there you get to know about the interaction between man and nature. And you realize that those in the dry lands, those who are in the dry lands are more innovative and they are more, they are far more innovative and more, um, uh, the, their environment is far more useful to them than to even those who are from the, the evergreen uh, rainforest area, you know. And so while I was in West Africa, I used to work, I was based in Burkina Faso at, in Ouagadougou. Uh, working in, in Niger, working in Mali, working in, uh, in right down to Ethiopia, where I'm today, all uh, I'm, uh, supporting communities involved in the, in, in the development of what we call uh, 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 non-timber forest product value chains, which are big. We are talking about um, um, uh, big uh, um, uh, commodities like honey and ghee product. We talk about commodities like she butter and she uh, uh, value chains. You talk about tamarindus. You talk about uh, moringa. These are all uh, sectors that are actually very big. If you look at the baobab tree, the baobab uh, value chains. These are value chains that 
go beyond uh, uh, our national boundaries, go beyond the national boundaries of all those countries because we supported women and today they are exporting, exporting tons and tons of, of Baobab powder from Ghana to the UK to the US. So, um, uh, yeah, so it's been a roller coaster life. And uh, from there, I had this opportunity. I was called by the Africa Union Commission uh, to support uh, with the development of the Great Green Wall with the coordination. And six years down the line, I'm here, and it's been uh, it's been been uh, interesting. No, it's been an interesting uh, right, especially uh, with the Great Green Wall, which is immense, which is big, which uh, um, you have multitude of partners, high level of expectations, lots of politics, lots and lots of policies, lots and lots of. Of, 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 of management of expectation, management of partners, management of countries, the countries, the over uh, um, um, 21 countries that are involved in the implementation of the program. You know how it is, so each country has its own program. They want to see it being implemented. You have to deal with the partners. You have to ensure that the, the, the the Great Green Wall is still very relevant in the policy uh, organs of the Africa Union because there are many, 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 many uh, different programs that the Africa Union is running. So it, it's quite interesting. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's really fascinating when, when uh, you read about it and you, you were just bringing um, uh, sort of this, this concept of scope up. And, and you know, when I, I, I sit here in the United States, but I, you know, I, I've never been to Africa, but I can look at a map mm. and I can see, wow, you know, as you were saying, dozens of countries. We have uh, from, from Senegal and Mauritania uh, in, in the West to Djibouti mm. and Eritrea. Djibouti, Eritrea, uh, Ethiopia. Yeah. How, mm. how um, take us through just a little bit, if you would, about um, as you were saying, you know, things are very different in these countries, uh, different uh, types of agricultural products and um, uh, different interests. Um, what was it like sort of bring, you know, beginning this? I mean, it, was this a, a, a difficult project to get started? Uh, how do you, uh, what was it like bringing together countries that, you know, are yeah, so 8,000 kilometers apart mm. <laughs> uh, and may not think of themselves as part of this Sahara, Sahel uh, basin, let's say, but all sh you know have to get on the same page. Let's say, take us through a little bit. Exactly. Of the oh, good. Yeah. The, 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 you see, in two thousand, if if you go back a bit to the uh, contemporary history of the Sahel and the drylands of Africa, you realize that it was it became a basket case when 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 uh, the the man, when. Uh, climate change started its manifestation, if I can put it that way. In the early 80s, you heard about the drought and the famine, even here in Ethiopia, there was a lot of talk about the famine in the drylands of Africa, and Ethiopia was an example of, of, of such thing. It was not only in Ethiopia, it was in Burkina Faso, in Mali, in Niger, in Chad, in Northern Cameroon, in Sudan. In the, in, the, in the northern countries, uh, um, uh, Libya, Tunisia, all those countries were suffering from high level of, 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 of by then they were saying, they said the advancement of the Sahara Desert, because the Sahara Desert is the benchmark for desertification in, in the world, in Africa. And so there was this mark, <coughs> there was this idea that said there was huge advancement of the Sahara Desert, and there were even uh, studies that showed that the Sahara Desert was encroaching 2%, two, uh, two centimeters yearly into, into uh, uh, the countries, the threshold, like those in the Sahel, uh, in, the, in the south, and those in the, in the Sahara region up north. And so, and be, prior to this time, many countries have had many small programs going on. If you go into Algeria, you hear about the green, uh, the green belt, even in Cameroon, you had the green revolution. In Burkina Faso, you had uh, um, uh, uh, President Thomas Sankara that was talking about the need for greening. In fact, he was the one that brought all this idea. In Libya, you had the, then uh, Gaddafi doing all this uh, thing of water management and bringing um, uh, water, uh, underground water for, for agriculture. So, Countries were trying to do their thing, but a program, a, a challenge 
like desertification, a challenge like land degradation, which was very much accelerated by climate change, when climate change started manifestation. And you had very serious drought, very serious flood. We had a, a migratory cricket, the locusts attacking. You had people losing everything that they ever had. And so when the heads of state of, of, of the African Union sat together to talk about this problem, they said, but look, this is a problem that cut across. It does not know national boundaries. There's a need for uh, a landscape, what we call the landscape approach. There's a need for a broad-based policy approach to this program. We, each country cannot do it alone. We would not succeed and we've not been succeeding. And so that is how the whole idea of the Great Green World came about. And the, why did the countries quickly come on board? Because they identified themselves to the problem. They saw their communities, that all their arable lands were being damaged. damaged. If you look at the Lake Chad uh, basin, the Lake Chad, the Lake Chad had reduced by more than, today we are talking about 93% from its initial uh, uh, 25,000 square uh, uh, kilometers. It had reduced by 90%, then now we are on 93%. And the Chad used to be the breadbasket for more than 40 million people in that region between Cameroon, Chad, Central Africa, uh, and uh, Niger, uh, Niger Republic. These, they were losing everything. And so there was a need for a concerted action. All the states accepted that all of us, we are having this problem. We need a, uh, 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 what we call a pan-African approach to this problem, we cannot do it alone. We need to put our effort together. We share best practices. We share resources. We develop the coincise, harmonized strategy that is going to support us to do this uh, program. And so that is how it came about. And so when the Africa Union as the apex uh, diplomatic and policy organ uh, 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 institution in the continent, took it under its umbrella so quickly it was adopted by the heads of state and there was the production now of what we call today the harmonized regional strategy for the implementation of the great going world which identified the challenges of each of this country what is it that is most important to you by then you know there was also the creation of the unc city the united nations uh, convention uh, to combat desertification. And each of these countries had produced what we call the National Action Plan to fight against desertification. And so, and then there was also the UNFCC, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And then there was also the CBD, the Convention on Biodiversity uh, Conservation. And so, but all of these, what we call multilateral environmental agreements were offline. There was no overacting policy, uh, a program that could bring all of these things together. And so with all this in mind, with all the challenges of combating desertification in silos, with all the need for resources, the need for a coincide Pan-African program, so quickly the Great Green Wall was created. And so it was easier because these countries identified with the problem that the Great Green Wall was trying to solve. So that is why countries quickly came on board from, from, uh, from the extreme west to the extreme south. And today we are now talking, we are now working at, at uh, expanding the program to the, to the dry lands of the Southern Africa. You know, so the 16, 14 countries of Southern Africa are also very dry. Mm. From Botswana, you know about the Kalahari Desert, the Namib Desert. The Kalahari Desert is one of the driest, even drier than the, 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 the Sahara Desert. And uh, countries like uh, Botswana, Namibia, Lesotho, Isini, South Africa, uh, um, um, uh, Malawi, Zambia, Tanzania, Zimbabwe, these countries are suffering from high level of drought today. If you, if you follow the news in Cape Town, there was a time that there was no water in 
one of the most uh, uh, tourist, the most attractive uh, cities in the world for tourism. There was no water. Waters were, were there was a lot of water rationing, even in, 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 in a cities like, like uh, uh, Vindo, countries like Gaberone. These are high, high world class cities. There was no water. And so today we are now working with the governments of this uh, region on how to extend the idea, the, the approach of the Great Green Wall uh, to this region. So the Great Green Wall in a nutshell was easily, easily adopted by all these diverse countries because they, were, they had a common problem, how to deal with the issue of land degradation, how to deal with the issue of desertification, yeah. Wonderful, wonderful, yes. appreciate that. What, um, before we get into some of the um, sort of the value added uh, outputs from that you, you know, you foresee from the, uh, the green wall, could you uh, very, and I, I, don't, I don't intend for you to, to give us a, a long lecture on this, but could you take us on some of the, the basics to de-desertification? I mean, in my, I, I have no background in ecology uh, as you do, but you know, I think obviously of three things. I think is obviously if you mentioned, I think of water, uh, yeah. I think of biomass above, and then of mm -hmm. course biomass below, so below, the, so yeah. the soils. What yeah. is, you know, obviously this is, uh, in my simplistic mind, this is not about, you know, showing up uh, at the Sahara Desert with a big hose and, what, and watering the Sahara, but what is involved at a very basic level when you think about what to do, do you start out with the plants that are already there growing and, and, and grow more of them? What is sort of the first, second, and third steps to a process like this? If you take us on a little bit on that journey. The first steps, the first steps in this thing is the policy. It's first of all to look at what is happening on the ground. You have to do some sort of a feasibility plan. What is happening? What is happening? Why is it happening? For instance, if you go to a country like Niger, you look at what are, what are the manifestations of desertification. So you have to, to, to make sure that you have this uh, uh, recorded. You have to look at what is happening specifically in each country, manifestation of desertification, how is it impacting the people, what are the policies saying, what are the policy makers uh, saying, what is the national policy on this? Is it existing? Is there a national policy? Is there no national policy? Is there no, um, uh, no uh, 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 nothing? Where, what, what are the, the, the governments or what have been happening with the NGOs? What has worked and what have not worked? What have worked and what have not worked? You know, and so we, we, we have to um, uh, um, uh, make sure that we have a clean, clear uh, uh, um, picture of what is going on in this region. So uh, the, 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 those are the first steps. The second steps now is to ask them, what can we do? What have you done? What are the, 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 the best practices as we call them? And what are the priorities of the country? You, it is very, very important to have this uh, done. Because you cannot just go in and say, oh, there's, there's desertification, I'm going to do this. The time when we used to have that, it has not worked. When we had experts coming from elsewhere to say, this is what was supposed to be done. Now, the approach that we are using is what we call, simply put as the participatory approach for it to be more inclusive, for, for the people to tell their own story. And when you have gathered all of this, and then, you know what their priorities are, you know what they can do, and then you look at the gaps. And so you can now say, okay, we are going to support this, uh, 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 this country in doing such thing. And so that is always, that is the beginning. That is the starting point of, uh, of the Great Green Wall. That is the starting point. And that is the difference between the Great Green Wall and other programs. That is the value proposition and the additionalities that the Great Green Wall brought because it came not as a program that was brought from outside, it was informed by people from inside. And so that is usually the first step. And then from then you look at 
if they say there was desertification, for instance, in, in Niger, what, what does it entail? What can be done once you have captured this and then you start, uh, 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 and we have what is called, uh, as I told you from the beginning, we have what we call the harmonized regional strategy, which gives an overarching strategy about what the great green world is all about and is developed in, in a, in a, uh, together with all these member states and then is adopted at the level of the heads of states because it's their program. And it's the interesting part of the Great Green was that it was heads of state that brought it, it was not experts. And so the acceptance, the acceptance were very, very, very important, you know. And so uh, by so doing now, when we have, when the heads of state have adopted the national, the, what we call the harmonized regional strategy, we now went to each of these countries that we identify as being part of this program in the, what we call the dry lands of Africa. We now go to these countries to produce what we call the national action plans. What, to produce what we call the national action plans, which was done at the level of these countries with everybody involved, with all the stakeholders, research, development, agriculture, water management, pastoralism, all of the, all the actors in these sectors, we try as much as possible to make the process very, very inclusive and leaving no one behind, you know. So, uh, uh, and by so doing, you now, after producing the national action plan, you now go down to say, okay, you have to put an implementation framework. What is going to be done, where, how, for how long, by so doing, that becomes a document for mobilization of resources, both internal and external resources. And then the field implementation. And what is the field implementation? Classical case of Niger that we started talking to, or it can be in, in uh, Mali or in Senegal. What are some of the activities that are on, undertaken within the framework of the Great Green World? You have uh, forestry, project, you have afforestation, you have reafforestation, you have what we call climate uh, smart agriculture, climate smart agriculture, which means you are using um, uh, 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 what we call uh, conservation agriculture, using things like organic fertilizers, creating fertilizers uh, uh, without, uh, uh, we have what we call low external uh, input agriculture in, in, in these areas. You look at issues like with pastoral livestock, you know, the, the, the main economy of these areas. Uh, either you are a farmer, a perennial small uh, holder farmer, or you are a small livestock farmer. And this area constitutes about 60% of the livestock in Africa. I'm talking here about the Sahel. Most of the livestock in Africa come from the Sahel. In fact, nearly all of it. We are talking here about 500 million to 600 million heads of cattle. Not to talk about donkeys, camels, sheep, goats. This is the mainstay of the camel. It's actually a pastoralist, a free ranging type of community. And besides, you have the farmers who are involved in in a rain-fed agriculture. When you mix, uh, uh, Ira, uh, Ira, when you mix agriculture and pastoral livestock in an area that is degraded, it's a recipe for disaster. It's a very serious problem. And I will tell you, the biggest problem of conflict that you hear from the Sahel today is because of competition among uh, uh, land users, especially between farmers and graziers. They are graziers that are free ranging. They have their range lands. They know that it's for them. They, they have what they call the transhuman system where they migrate from, Dar from, from, from Mauritania, from Dakar. They go down towards the south where there is fertile grass, where there is water. And they do that six months round a year. And on the way they meet, I'm just giving you a picture of what is happening there. They meet farmers that are involved in their small agriculture. The maize, the sogum, the millet, the wheat, 
And when these animals see fresh looking grass, of course it is grass. They go in. And that is where I can say without fear of contradiction that more than nearly all the conflict, call it Boko Haram today, call it Boko Haram, call it Akmi, call it Mujao, call it whatever you want to call it. Most of the actors that are involved in this conflict are disgruntled about one thing, the inability for them to have either grazing land for their cattle or fertile land for their agriculture, to put it in a very, very layman's way. When the land is degraded, when the land is degraded, what do you expect? Look at Lake Chad, 40 million people. All of them are either headers, pastoralists, they are fishermen, they are hunters, or they are farmers. When you lost 93% uh, of the water body that was feeding these 40 million people, and this is a very conservative estimate about the population in this area, what will you expect? That is a time bomb if nothing is done. It's a time bomb. So what we do, we look into issues of rangeland. How can we ameliorate? How can we improve on rangelands? How the issues of water, how can we better manage the water? These are areas that six, six uh, that you can have uh, 100 to 200 millimeters of rainfall in two days. And after that, that is the end. You won't get it again. There are, there are places there with rainfall about 200 to 400 millimeters a year. And all of this rainfall can fall in one week, causing massive flooding, damaging lives and livelihood. And then you have drought that can go on for the next nine months. And so it's an area of extreme weather conditions. And that is why desertification becomes so easy because when the rain exposes the vegetation cover, when the animals eat it up, and when the farmers have to work their farms, and then you have no water in for nine months, it creates what we call hot pans and it transforms the whole thing into desert. And so it's a very uh, serious tax. So there is no one activity that you can undertake to say you are going to combat desertification. If you want to plant trees, you have to mine. If you're only planting trees, where are you going to plant the trees? You'll probably be planting it where the farmers were intending to, to work their maize. Or you're going to plant it where the, pastoral, the pastoralists will be passing with their livestock. So, it is, it is a lot of different uh, 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 activities that you have to take at the same time to ensure a, a certain level of balance in anything that you're doing. So it's quite exciting, but it's very challenging. Yeah, very, very it, challenging. It, it definitely sounds like it. And it's interesting you brought up, I was gonna ask you, uh, uh, obviously the question, you know, we, 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 we see things occasionally about things, groups like Boko Haram on the, um, uh, on the news here. Um, I was interested sort of, well, actually this is really a two part question as a follow up. Number one, obviously you mentioned a lot of the, um, the obvious uh, you know, value added with regard to some of these food products and, and the, uh, the different agricultural uh, products in this context. Uh, are there any um, other sort of I was involved in a project several years ago at a Togo uh, on sort of the cosmetic front using some very interesting um, uh, plants uh, from, from that area. Any interesting, just from your perspective, uh, non-food um, opportunities that you think are extremely high value? Also things like uh, obviously global warming, maybe carbon capture markets. And then sort of a second part to that, you, you know, you mentioned Boko Haram. Have you personally, you know, as you've been out there uh, looking, you know, at, at the issues in the different countries, have you ever 
any, any interesting stories of running into any of these uh, angry parties that uh, <laughs> Dr. You know, say Dr. Tonga, leave, <laughs> get out of here, or you know, <laughs> any interesting stories on that front uh, that you want to tell? Yeah, yeah, I think um, you touch a very important issue to talk at, to look at issues to do with like carbon projects. If I start with that. You see, there, there's a lot of, uh, one thing that is happening is that there's a lot of misunderstanding of the Sahel. People look at the Sahel just at the level of the basket case. The Sahel is not only uh, this, these challenges that we are talking about. It's not only about desertification. The Sahel also have some of the most fertile lands and some of the longest rivers. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, the, uh, the, the Nile River, which is to the uh, running between uh, Ethiopia and uh, Sudan and Egypt. If you look at uh, the river Niger that is running between uh, um, uh, um, Niger Republic, Burkina Faso, Mali, uh, right up to part of Nigeria and things and places like that. There's a huge, huge opportunity for carbon pro programs. When we talk carbon programs, because we, 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 we do a lot of things. When we talk carbon programs to most potential funders, they say, oh, yes, I have. You know, trees will not grow there that fast. And, you know, there are all these challenges and all these things. Of course, there are those challenges. But you fail to, to understand, to, to uh, people fail to, to look at the context. When you talk about carbon, you're not only talking about the, the, the as you talk about the tree carbon, there's also the, the under, or we can put the underground carbon that uh, is being formed when you support uh, carbon uh, programs. You also talk about, and when you look at the trees from the Sahel, you see that they are far more stronger and they absorb more carbon and they contain more carbon than, other, than in other areas. And it's been proven, these are very, very, if you look at a tree like Acacia Senegalensis, these are very tough trees. The tougher the trees, the more concentration of, of carbon. And, just like in any other part of the weather, they, they, they usually bring up all these ideas of bushfires and, and things like that. It happens everywhere. Even in the, in the Amazon, we have bushfires that have been burning forever. But in the Sahel, it's very unlikely because these people depend on these trees for their livelihood daily, daily. And so carbon projects are very interesting. I have a few a carbon project that is being done in Burkina Faso and other uh, areas, but it's not very popular. And which, um, uh, because of this idea that it's a rich zone, it's, uh, the trees cannot do better, it's really, really sapping up or uh, 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 making this, the, the population in these areas to lose out. You know, they're not having the type of investment, long-term investment that they can have if the story was different, if the way people look at the Sahel was, and the dry lands of Africa was a bit different. Talking about the challenges of, of, of uh, working, one of the biggest challenges we have today is that of security. If you follow the news, you will hear about, first of all, in Mali, we ACME and, and, uh, and uh, um, uh, Al Shabaab in, 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 uh, in Somalia, in Eritrea, you hear, in, you hear about ACME in the Sahel, you hear about Boko Haram in, in, in Nigeria, in Chad, in Northern Cameroon, in Sahel. They, uh, uh, in, in Burkina Faso, these are very, very, these are daily challenges that we face. And every time that you go to the field, you meet but the, the, the thing is, that the interesting part of it, uh, Ira, is that these guys are faceless people. You don't know who is who. They are faceless. It's not the conventional soldiers where you have people in uniforms. The very guys that are working on their farms and protecting their animals, the next minute they can become the very Akmi and the uh, Mujao that you, you never knew, the Boko Haram that you never knew. And, and, and so we, we have, oh, we've encountered many of these cases where we are going for fee visit and they will tell you, you can't go to this area. No way. You can't go to this area because we are not so sure of the security of this area. And I will tell you, we've counseled for this year before the coming of COVID, 
2019 cancel many of our field activities because of security concerns because this the people in the community they will tell you that we cannot ensure your security we used to work in in, in northern mali in a uh, duanza tumbuktu we have projects in in a uh, um, um, in uh, Tuminyang, in Sang, in Mopti, in Banjagara, all these areas that you only hear uh, today about Acme and uh, uh, Acme and, uh, uh, and all these uh, terrorist and, and, and uh, terrorist groups that are, are patrolling the whole Sahel. These are areas that we used to walk in and we used to go there every time in Duanza, Banjagara, very, very beautiful places, historic places, but Today you cannot dare because if you go to the capitals, you say, I want to go to Mopti in Mali, they will tell you, please don't go because we cannot ensure your security. And many of our, our field, field, uh, field, field workers, many of them, some of them were adopted like in Burkina Faso, some of them were killed, some of them were sent away from their uh, the areas of activity. So yes, the danger is real. The problems are real, but the problems are also very much interwoven. Because when there is a failure, when there's a structural failure in this region, it means, in, if you look at, when there's a structural failure in any of this region, it degenerates very quickly and it becomes an, some sort of ethnic, religious type of type of challenges. Because if you go to the Sahel, things are very distinct. Most of the, most, um, a, a big chunk, more than 50% of those who are involved in pastoralists are mostly those of the Muslim belief. Most of those who are involved in perennial agriculture are mostly of Christian and animist belief. And so that is why you see these problems become entangled into religious, ethnic type of conflict, as we see today in Nigeria, in Chad, in, in, uh, in Cameroon, and in other parts of the giants of Africa. So it's, it's a mixture of everything. And within the framework of the Great Green World, we try, we are working in all of these sectors to, because you can't intervene in one area. You can't say, I'm just going to do agroforestry, I'm going to do afforestation. No, you have to look at it from a landscape perspective. You are doing agroforestry, but you are also doing climate smart agriculture. You are also looking at water management. You are looking at rangeland management. You are looking at the issues of health. You're looking at issues of infrastructure. You're looking at issues of energy, because one of the biggest challenges in that area, 90%, of the energy needs of these people uh, uh, satisfied through natural cutting down of trees, cutting down of grass, cutting down for them to be able to cook, to be able to light, to be able to, to, to heat food or anything. So you have to provide multitude of multifaceted type of intervention in everything that you are doing within the framework of, of this program. Because the problems are interwoven. One cause might, one uh, uh, solution might be the cause for a challenge in, 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 in another sector. While you are solving uh, the farmer, the grazing problem, you might be creating problems for the farmers. While you are solving the farmer problem, you might be creating problems for the graziers or for the foresters. Or for, so. It's, it's, it's a very serious um, uh, um, uh, uh, interwoven type of what uh, uh, our colleagues of common land calls wicked problems. Wicked problems because there is no, no direct solution. There is no panacea. Yeah. The, the one other thing I wanted to ask you about, I, I don't know if you've, you've run into too much of these uh, technologies a, along the way, but you know, I, I, you know, in looking at the uh, Sahara and the Sahel, obviously there's several countries in the uh, group that have, you know, not just have desert, but they have coastal uh, deserts. Exactly. Um, yeah. And several years ago, I remember reading about a, uh, a project, I think it was, I don't know if it was in Djibouti or Eritrea, but uh, where they were doing um, seawater related 
reclamation of the deserts, uh, mm. in essence, pumping seawater into some of these coastal deserts to grow various uh, fish, uh, you know, um, aqu aquacultural related aquacultural, things, also, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, sort of salt water tolerant type crop. I was just interested in sort of as because you were mentioned also sort of Namibia and some of these other coastal deserts. Uh, anything interesting that you've been looking at at the African Union with regard to salt water uh, related opportunities for desertification? Exactly. We uh, um, we 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 have this program called TAP, Trans African Pipeline. Trans African Pipeline, which is is an idea from our colleagues uh, in uh, scientific um, response, looking at the issues of water. You know, water, water is the basis for all these problems. Water is uh, the availability of water, sufficient water, good quality water, is the challenge here. And so the, the TAP Foundation, or they call the Trans-African Pipeline Foundation, uh, we'll be working with this group uh, based in Atlanta and, uh, and also in Canada for development of a pipeline along these countries. You know, we, as we talk about coastal drylands, like Senegal is, you know, it's on the Atlantic coast. They have the coast, the, the, the part of the Atlantic coast. Mauritania is also a coastal uh, dryland countries. And then you, you move right down and then you, you, you come to Djibouti, which is also uh, a, coast, a coastal area in Somalia. And, and also uh, uh, if we include Cameroon, it's also a, also a, a coastal part of the country. And so we looked at what can we do about this issue? There's water is available. But the problem is that it's not the appropriate water, it's salt water. How can we do so that this water can become useful, can become, uh, uh, can solve these problems of, of uh, lack of appropriate water? And so the TAP, the Trans-Africa Pipeline uh, was developed. And the whole idea is still there is setting off of desalination plant, let's say in, 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 in Mauritania, in, in Dakar, put up pipelines, pass through countries, or part of those countries that actually need water. So you have desalination plants in one area, and then you develop pipelines uh, about uh, um, uh, um, uh, 6,000 miles of pipelines across the 8,000 kilometer belt of the Great Green Wall from Dakar to Djibouti. And then you take water from Djibouti and then you pump it up through another. So the plan was to have three desalination plants along the Great Green Wall that will provide um, uh, um, uh, fresh water for agriculture. And also this salt, because the, 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 the salts that we produce are also very, very bankable, marketable uh, products. And you use, and you know, I'm a, I'm a, uh, uh, so, uh, solar energy, the sun, these are places with, we can say 14 hours of sunshine a day, you know. So we will use the solar energy to do the desalination plant, and where the plants are found, communities are there, it will create jobs, thousands of jobs, we're going to provide them with energy, and then we would use the water for irrigation, for it will become portable water for cooking and for, and we'll solve all the challenges of waterborne diseases and all these things. So the pipe will run along the Great Green Wall. And the, the, <clears throat> the program is still ongoing but you know the challenges with with such a uh, program is apart from the finance how why are you going to have the four billion dollars that we needed to develop this plan because about four to, to six billion dollars depends on uh, depending on inflation and the period and then other challenges like the pipelines protection security 
Okay. But it is still under discussion. And some countries like Mauritania, they are very much in favor of it. And there was, a, 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 with the, uh, the, the Trans-Africa Pipeline Foundation, there was, uh, we discussed and there was uh, the signing of a memorandum of understanding with the government of Mauritania. And uh, we are now looking at how to, 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 to develop it. It takes time, the negotiation takes time because of issues, especially of security, pipeline protection, uh, um, uh, uh, quantity of water, what would be the impact of, on the, the, the water and things like that. There's a lot of scientific stuff that has to be responded. Apart from that, we also have um, uh, um, what we call the desert to energy project. This desert to energy is the, the, the harnessing the, 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 the the solar uh, energy development of solar plants, you know, and we are working with this, uh, with the Africa Development Bank on this, and hopefully it's going to come to fruition because these areas, as I said, they are not poor areas, they are not poor. We just need to use the right technology. These areas have 12 to 14 hours of sunshine, even when in the night they still produce sun that is able to, 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 uh, to provide enough energy if you look at uh, countries like, like uh, in, in the kingdom of Morocco, they have, they have some of the biggest solar energy farms in the world, in, 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 in the desert, yeah. And so we're going to, we're also planning to look at these issues of, uh, of a desert to energy, how to harness the, the, the sunshine and, and the heat that is characteristic of this region to, 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 to uh, encourage uh, institute development because when you have the energy, you have the water, and then the problem is solved. So we are also looking at various uh, uh, innovation and uh, and how technology can support the 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 the, the can can bring in how uh, technology can bring in the solution to these uh, challenges. And once we have energy, we have the water, we are fine. Yeah. Fascinating. Completely, completely fascinating vision. Um, you know, one, one typical question we ask as we begin to wrap up the show uh, is about sort of some of the people that you work with. Um, it, yeah. Important, obviously, you've been at the, the African Union, the United Nations, various think tanks. Uh, any specific people that uh, have influenced you, maybe mentored you along the way, uh, that have sort of been very instrumental in your path or, or keeping you on this new path uh, that you want to mention at this point of the uh, the interview. Uh, you take your time to, to shout no, out to anyone you want to. The, the, the main people that we can, I can talk about are the communities. Those people at the frontline uh, era, era. I hope one day you will have the time to come uh, visit and you will see how resilient, how resilient these people are. The women, especially, that are at the front line, how they manage to provide for their children, both food, health, security, how families and people go at length just to stay alive, just to have a cup of water. The girl child that goes for tens of kilometers a day just to look for potable water, which between me and you is not potable, it's far from being potable. It's far from being water that you can even give to your animals, talk less of to yourself. And so those are the people that would inspire you to stay, to stay. Those are the people that will make you to understand that what you are doing is important. Those are the people that will keep you going. But apart from that, we have very, very strong, strong, um, uh, um, uh, strong partners. As I was saying, we have, apart from the community people that are trying to take their future into their own hands. And these communities, they are not playing victims, actually. They don't want to be seen as victims. These are very, most of them are very, very strong tribal people with very rich history. If you look at the history, you look at Timbuktu. Timbuktu, that is where the first universities were built. And these are the areas we're talking. When you talk about Mopti, we're talking about former empires, Kanu, Kaduna, all these people, they are proud people. They don't want to play victims, they just want to live. And so when you go there, you're inspired. And apart from that, we have, as I told you, the Great Green Wall, 
is a mixture of partners. Partners, our development partners are very, very important. And if you want to look at the top of the range of our partners, you have the European Union, the, East, the EU, these are our closest partners. You have FAO, the, 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 the UN Food and Agriculture Organization. You have the UNCCD, the UNCCD, these are natural partners because the Great Green Wall, one in the preamble of the Great Green Wall, it is about supporting the real conventions, you know, the three real conventions, convention on desertification, convention on uh, climate change and convention uh, and the, the uh, biodiversity convention. So we are supporting these conventions straight in the field, in the most challenging areas. And so by nature, the UN, the UNEP, the UNCCD, all of these are our partners. And you have the World Bank, which is there. You have the GEF, the Global Environmental Fund. These are all our partners. Apart from that, you have the civil society organizations and the NGOs, those who are working in those communities. We have like CIVIC, uh, CIVIC in the UK. You have uh, the HOPE Initiative in, in uh, Ireland. You have uh, SOS Sahel uh, International in France and in, uh, in, in, uh, in, 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 in Senegal. You have various, various uh, programs like One Billion Trees for Africa. You have um, uh, um, uh, um, Green Aid, uh, OGs. These are people who are working at the front line of the Great Green World. They, some of them are financial partners, some are our technical partners, and some are there with us uh, uh, daily, ensuring that we have uh, uh, that we, when I say we, we're talking about the, the, mem the, the countries that are uh, implementing this program to have all the necessary uh, uh, support that is needed. Yeah. So um, it, it's, it's, as I say, it's a, it's a, it's a great program. It's, it's a great program, but so far, a lot of impact, lot and lot of impact. If you look at the last, uh, reports about the impact a decade of implementation to about about 20 million hectares of land being uh, rehabilitated over uh, uh, millions of 90 million uh, uh, dollar raised through uh, um, uh, economic activities you look at job about 500,000 people being employed uh, through the program you look about I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a peace building initiative. You look at, uh, at pro programs like in Nigeria that are looking at issues to do with those who have been displaced by conflict. How do we help them to build back better? And you look about various uh, issues that we, we are doing. And when we talk, uh, we look at the, the, the current context of COVID. It, it, it has come, it, you know, COVID might Ha these people, the people in the rural areas are disproportionately impacted by COVID. These people don't have the water that we are telling them, wash your hands. They don't even have water to drink and then you want these people to wash their hands three times a day. Every time you cannot touch your nose, you cannot touch your eye, you have to wash your hands. These people don't have. And so COVID, the impact of COVID, the social distancing measures like the lockdown, critically disproportionately impacted the people in this region because they could not go out, they don't have the money, uh, the markets were logged, you know. These are people that live day to day, hand to mouth. Uh, and so um, uh, COVID have been a, a very serious issue. Like the whole of this year, usually with the implementation of these projects, we used to have, uh, uh, we used to temporarily employ some people in this community but we had to stop all our active activities. So you see that these people are suffering from the extreme weather, they're suffering from conflict with the Boko Harams, they're suffering from conflict uh, uh, among uh, st uh, stakeholders, uh, fighting on water and fertile land, and then COVID came in to destroy everything for them. And so these guys have really been disproportionately uh, uh, 
uh, I can put it targeted by COVID and the social distancing measures that were put in place. And so we, we need to look on how. And unfortunately, again, when people are talking about coping the impact of COVID, they're only looking at vaccination, they're looking at health issues, uh, PPEs, but nobody's talking about nature. Nobody's talking about the, the, the degradation of nature that first of all led to COVID. We talk, they talk about the link between COVID, uh, the, the animals, the pangolins and the birds. How did all of this come about? It came about because of the degradation of habitat, habitat loss. But now that uh, this, the area of environmental uh, restoration, the area of restoration, climate change is not even featured. They are not even essential areas. And so most of the, the solutions that we are looking for, we want vaccines, but we're fine. We, we are developing PPEs, watch. But they fail to look at the root cause of the COVID. How comes that pangolins have become vectors of human diseases? How comes that bats have become vectors of human diseases? What can we do to restore the habitat so that these things don't happen again? Nobody's talking about it. It's vaccine, 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 vaccine. It's, it's PPE, PPE, it's about uh, sanitizers, it's about... So the root cause of COVID, the root cause of pathogens that will stay calm, it's not begin, it's, uh, nobody's talking about them. Nobody's talking about them. And all the funds, most of the countries relocated the funds that were meant for this project into fighting uh, COVID. That's like robbing Peter to pay Paul, you know, because you, you take money for the Great Green Wall and that's what we, we, we found. You take money that was meant for the Great Green Wall that you are going to, uh, to use it for COVID relief. You know, you're going to use it to support the, the Africa Center for Disease Prevention and Control to develop for the COVID. But uh, I mean, that is, moving, uh, uh, it, it, there is no sense in it. And that, that's why we've been calling our ministers, our countries to ensure that the environment sector, the restoration sector, the forestry sector becomes essential sectors for building back uh, a better, to looking at green solution, nature-based solution for COVID. It's not only about uh, vaccination and, PP, and PPEs, which are great, but if we want long-term sustainable, um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, solutions to such challenges, we must look at it from a broader perspective rather than focusing only on health and the health sector. You know, so these are all linked. You know, yeah, these are these are excellent uh, wrap up points because yeah, we've we've occasionally touched on topics of sort of what we say keeping nature in nature, and as you're saying, uh, mm. if we don't if we don't want the bats to <laughs> to come mix with us or the pangolins, we got to keep where they live livable and uh it's exactly a, that's a really it's a really great point we've, we've we've tried to touch on that a bit and i really appreciate you uh sort of bringing that up as a uh as, as a sort of a, an epilogue to what we're dealing with right now so i think that's yeah, exactly. uh, really great the yeah um you know it, it's been really inspiring and enlightening hearing about uh, a project of this nature and and really wishing you uh, the best with it moving forward. I mean, it's done so much and it uh, you know, has the potential to keep doing. Um, for everybody that's going to be watching on this particular uh, episode on either the YouTube channel or listening across the various podcast networks, uh, you've been listening to the amazing Dr. Paul Elvis Tongam, uh, who is coordinator for the Great Green Wall Initiative at the African Union Commission, uh, located at their headquarters in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Uh, Dr. Tangham, thank you for, for taking the time to come on the show. Um, thank you for everything you're doing and continue to do. Uh, and as, as we say uh, routinely, thank you for moving this part of the human story forward because it is mm. truly an extremely important one and uh, impacts the lives of so many. So really, thank you very much for, for once again taking the time to, to enlighten us and, and educate us on all these topics. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ira. And I will just invite, I will be talking. In fact, I will be invited by the 
Naperville Nepal, uh, High, High School in Illinois, in California, to talk about the Great Green Wall. There's a film that is going to be screened on the Great Green Wall on the 30th of December. You can check in on, uh, on Twitter, you can check it on LinkedIn, uh, Naperville uh, uh, High, High School in Illinois. I hope I have it right. And, and, and there are lots of videos on, on, uh, on uh, lots, lots, lots of, of documentaries and videos on, on YouTube that can really um, help people to understand how, uh, how. And, 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 and what we are trying to do now is to build a movement, to build a movement around the Great Green Wall. We don't want it to be a classical project that is going to be sponsored by the big names of the World Banks. They, they, they no longer have the, 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 the appropriate resources. We need about $400 billion for this program. You know, if you take it that to, to, to restore one hectare of land, one hectare per year is 540, uh, uh, almost $540 per hectare. And this is a very conservative price. And if you know that by 2030, we are targeting uh, 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 100 million hectares of the 1 billion hectares that we want to, to restore. So it's that it, it needs everyone on board. It, we, we are creating a movement around it. Everyone on board. We have to do, build the resilience. We have to, 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 to build back better from the COVID. We need to use um, um, uh, a nature-based solution to be back from COVID. It's only true nature-based solution. COVID is a nature, it's a nature problem. We can only use nature to build it back. To, to come back to where we were, you know. Yeah, it's an, an unfortunate lesson, but uh, if it gets us on the right path, uh, you know. Thank you so much, Dr. Tangam. It's, it's been really a great time. <laughs> thanks a lot. Thanks, 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 thanks. We'll keep in touch.